for you now. Um, I have many thanks to the organizers for the invitation. And as uh, most of us, I have a heartfelt uh, uh, enthusiasm for a time when we can all meet together in the same room in person. So the talk today is going to be uh, about two related problems. Um, one of them is very new, and the other one is uh, still relatively new. And uh, the spirit of my presentation for this conference will be to focus on the word combinatorics perspective, and I will also be spending some time highlighting some of the invariants, again, keeping the spirit of um, the topics of, of, of our gathering. So the first few slides, I think, have been said a few times, but I at least want to make sure I've said them. We have a finite alphabet, and we have the set of finite words on that alphabet. That's the first two lines. Uh, for me, a language will always include the two properties that it is extendable in both directions, meaning if I have a word, I can extend it on the left and the right and still be within the language. And any word has all of its factors or subwords within the language. That's the second property. Uh, a, another object that's been discussed a few times during this conference already, as far as I've seen, is the factor of subword complexity. So I include that again here for a reminder after lunch or breakfast, depending on where you are. Uh, you take all the words in your language of length n, and you count how many there are. And that is what we call the complexity function. Now I'll switch over to dynamics uh, just for a moment. Uh, so the languages that we're discussing are related to dynamical systems called subshifts. Again, a subshift for me, I guess this might be one difference is one-sided. Um, it's okay thinking of it one or the other um, usually works out, but they're all infinite sequences where every subword exists within the language. That's how you define the subshifts from my perspective. You have the left shift map, left shift map, and the the subshift is a dynamical system whose topology and Borel sigma algebra is generated by these cylinder sets. So um, a cylinder would be a all of the sequences whose prefix agrees with a given word. And that's important because this is exactly why we can talk about dynamics on a system by thinking about uh, words and languages. From the dynamical perspective, uh, just as a reminder, we have the set of shift invariant probability measures. Uh, it has a convex structure, meaning if we take two measures within uh, the this, this set and we take a scalar convex combination, it's also going to be an invariant probability measure. From this perspective then, I will first define for this talk the ergodic measures then as the extremal ones. Uh, so there's no way to write an ergodic measure down as a convex combination of two other measures. And that's what this definition says here. It's also important for some of the constructions in our talk. Typically, when people talk about ergodic measures, though, the, often the pointwise or Birkhoff ergodic theorem comes into play. So if I'm an ergodic measure, then there's this nice property that almost every point in my dynamical system has a space average equal to the time average. And translated into a subshift, it means that if I take one of these sequences and I look at the first n symbols make that word, and I count how often, uh, so I'm sorry, I did see someone saying they cannot hear me. Is this uh, a global problem? So it's just, okay. Uh, it's okay for, for us on BBB, so. Okay. It's okay uh, here in, in Marseille. And maybe you can uh, reload on uh, Ibar, you can maybe just reload and... Okay. Uh, so the way, the way that I would write pointwise, uh, the pointwise ergodic theorem here is that if I take the, the length n prefix of this infinite sequence x, I count how often the word L or word W I'm considering occurs and divide by the length, that average as n goes to infinity will converge to the measure of the cylinder of that word. And we're going to call one of these points a row generic point. So then the other word in the slide, a 
title as a generic measure, and this is less often discussed, I think, for sure, than ergodic measures, a generic measure is just one such that one of these points exists. So it's not happening necessarily in abundance, but it's but they, they do exist where you find one that does, whose frequencies do represent the measure, uh, the generic measure. And I think I've fast forward enough to yeah get past problems here. So there's this natural connection that ergodic measures have many, many, many generic points. So an ergodic measure definitely is generic, but not necessarily all generic measures are ergodic. So for instance, they're not necessarily extremal within this space of measures. I think with that, I've given all the definitions. Um, so then kind of the global question that uh, I find interesting in, in this program is, what relationships can we find in the languages that define our subshifts to tell us something about the ergodic, or in this case, generic measures of the corresponding dynamical system? So I've left it broad on purpose, but we'll come to a couple of um, answers uh, here in the next few slides. So most recently, I'm, I'm finishing this, this work here. Uh, if I have a, a language that's uniformly recurrent, I'll remind of that definition soon and the complexity uh, function grows in a specific linear way. So if I take the number of words of length n in the language, dividing by n, I get a number, and the number has to be large enough for um, just technical reasons, then the number of generic measures cannot be more than k minus two. So the first thing I'll point out um, is that it's a result by Cassane that if the limit here exists, that number must be an integer. So you can't have that this limit is 3.5, for example. Uniform recurrence, as a reminder, um, means that if I want to consider uh, any length little n, there is going to be a block size capital N such that all blocks of length capital N uh, contain every word of length little n as a subword. So there's a specific window size that no matter where I look along uh, any sequence, for instance, I will see everything of size little n. Uh, for dynamicists, this is equivalent to the minimality of the corresponding dynamical system. And just as a reminder, or maybe as a note, uh, in the spirit of invariance, um, both the limb soup and limb inf of this quantity, pn over n, these are both invariant under topological conjugacy. So in some sense, it's a very stable and invariant uh, quantity. So certainly the limit itself is invariant. Um, okay. So the next, the next result is a little bit older, but it's um, gonna require an extra definition. The first two on my list are more standard. So a word in the language, as a reminder, is left special if I can extend it on the left by more than one symbol, and respectively right special if I can extend it on the right by more than one symbol. I'm it sorry, John, to interrupt you. No, it's maybe not well chosen, but there's a question by Ronnie uh, on the on the chat, and maybe uh, Julien can help. So Ronnie uh, doesn't find uh, this paper by Cassegna. So it's on Matsinet, so it, it's in the count book. So it's in the count book. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, sorry. yeah I'm sorry. It's it's in yeah. It's in a, it's in a. It was hard for it was hard to find the book as well. I actually had to ask Hussein for the exact reference, and I, I achieved the physical copy after after searching too. So, uh, Kassane yeah, and Nicola. Oh yes. So I'm sorry. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, my my apologies. Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry for the interruption. No, no. It's it's. Uh, and my apologies to Nicholas. So. Uh, I guess, I guess in my mind, it's a, it's a continuation of Kassane's uh, paper about uh, special factors. It, it's, it's a continuation of an earlier paper, and I just I misremember this in my head when I created my slides. So that's completely my mistake. Um, so uh, word is left or right special if you can extend it more than one way. It's uh, by special if I can extend it more than one way on both the left and the right. Uh, now, the next definition is less. It's not standard in that um, exactly standard. Uh, a word is regular by special if exactly one left extension is right special and exactly one right extension is left special. Mm -hmm. So I will include, uh, and I want to remark that uh, like typically when we talk about by special words, for those that 
stare at these longer, um, we talk about weak, ordinary, and strong by special. Um, as far as I know, those are typically words that we reserve for languages of size two. So think of regular by special as one way to extend to a larger alphabet. I reserve the right to have that be partially a lie, what I just said as well. So as, as just a, a clarifying picture, uh, we have uh, pictures of some snippets of Rusi graphs. These are just representations, directed graphs that represent information about our language. So a Rusi graph, for instance, where n equals two, has all the words of length two that occur in the language as the vertices. And the edges are words of length three in this case, meaning that the word BAA exists. Therefore, there is an edge that starts with BA and ends at AA for the Rusi graph where n is two. And then likewise for n equals three, um, there are words of length three, the edges correspond to words of length four. I would point out, for instance, the edge that I've already marked represents the word BAA. So notice that every edge in a Rusi graph of, for N becomes a vertex in the Rusi graph for N plus one. Uh, and the information from the Rusi graph for length N tells us about all the vertices here, but not the edges. So in the top picture, I would point out, maybe now I'll delete this. Uh, this is a bi-special word there. AA is a bi-special, it's left and right special. Notice that one left extension in the top graph is right special. One right extension on the top graph is left special, whereas that's not the case for the bottom. So this is a, a clear, hopefully clarifying picture that in the top picture, um, if this was the language that's defining our graphs, uh, we are regular by special for AA in the top, and we are not in the bottom. Um, are there any uh, questions? Sounds like there's a lot of chatter, but I'll leave it to the organizers to tell me if something should be. Oh uh, yes, there, there is a discussion in the in the chat. Uh, so Hank uh, told us that uh, the result by Kassin was already uh, proved by Alex Einis uh, in the 90s in this PhD thesis. And um, uh, Alex Einis was a student of Rob Tideman. And uh, Ronnie uh, just um, clarified this point, saying that Einis proved the limit could not be in uh, one, two. And uh, Julien added that Alex had the result when the limit is at most two, and he left the general problem as a conjecture. Yes, yeah, I, I, I guess it anticipates that particular mention to be quite as controversial, but it certainly was a, a very, I think, very uh, tremendous kind of fact when I first heard it, and uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so we're gonna call a language, we're gonna say the language satisfies the regular by special condition if all the words, um, all sufficiently long by special words are regular. Uh, and it's a, it's a nice exercise um, since there's some preserving of the structure of these Rusi graphs or how these words that extend uh, to create your language are controlled. Uh, you actually are going to, under the regular by special condition, have eventually constant growth. This means that for some sufficiently large n, the complexity grows in this very nice affine formula, where there's a growth constant k that arises. Okay, so I think there's sufficiently enough words to get to the uh, kind of, uh, to the next result that I'll mention. So this is with Michael Damron from Georgia Tech. Um, it's been recently accepted into the Ergodic Theory and Dynamical Systems Journal. Um, if I have a language that's recurrent, that satisfies this regular by special condition with its growth rate, then the number of ergodic measures is bounded from above by k plus one over two. Um, so, I mean, just I'll, just numerically, this is a better bound than the previous one in terms of a number because it, the linear factor is k over two versus k. Um, for a reminder, recurrence just means that if I have two words in the language, then there is a long enough word that has u as a prefix and has v as a, as a suffix. Top, uh, dynamically, this is equivalent to topological transitivity. And here I wanna be careful, I don't mean point transitive, I mean, um, I mean the definition using two open sets. Turns out that while we were working uh, on this paper, uh, there's been a number of works by Dolce and Perrin, so uh, to be, again, more careful than I was previously, this, the the results I mentioned here are actually from two papers by these authors. Um, one of them says that um, 
regular by special condition is equivalent to a property that, uh, so it, it turns out that regular by special condition is equivalent to eventual dendricity. So they defined a property of language is called eventually dendric. They show that that property is closed under topological conjugacy and it also under this property, recurrence is equivalent to uniform recurrence. So really, it just allowed our title or our theorem to sound more impressive because at this case, recurrence is equivalent to uniform recurrence. Okay, so I'll take a moment to explain maybe why, uh, from my dynamical perspective, these questions, uh, why, why these, where these, maybe these, these specific conditions came up. Um, and so I'll briefly remind that there's a, stem, a set of dynamical systems called interval exchange transformation. And I'm gonna pick this number K plus one somewhat artificially, but for reasons as we'll soon see. So on a certain number of intervals, the way you define an interval exchange is you have these length parameters that cut your interval up into K plus one pieces. So this is length L1, for example. And the a permutation pi will tell you in what order to rearrange all of these to get back to another interval. So in this case, this is what I'd call the four, three, two, one permutation. The fourth, the first interval goes to four, second goes to three, three goes to two, and so on. So everything slides around. Um, on the next slide, there's kind of an obligatory picture. I'm sorry, I'm used to pushing an arrow key to make the slides move. Um, it's just showing that while you're doing something that's defined by a permutation, the underlying dynamical system is much richer. So in this picture, the idea is we're showing what happens when I take these first intervals cut by these colors and I keep applying the map over and over again. So for instance, this is the first interval, so it gets moved to the last interval as defined by the, per, uh, the permutation, the length um, transformation definition. But then when I apply the map again, this is my first interval, so this piece, it's translated to be the last interval again. So I've actually cut what used to be my third interval up now into two pieces because, and really three, because you notice that there's a second part that gets moved to here, and then a third part that gets moved with part of the blue and red over here and so on. So basically this is not a, if you have four intervals, for example, this is not a four periodic transformation. That's essentially what I wanna say here. So independently, Anatole Katok and Bill Veach showed that if you have a minimal interval exchange, then the number that we talked about on the, our second result is the bound that you expect for the number of invariant measures, or the number of ergodic measures. And I should point out that this is, this is a generalization. It's not quite accurate. Um, the bound itself really depends on the permutation, and it can be strictly less than this number. It's already known within the realm of, of interval exchanges that this bound is the correct one. So there are, um, throughout time, there have been examples uh, finishing up with this last paper where every possible way you could write an interval exchange down, you get exactly the bound that you expect. So there's nothing, there's nothing new there. Uh, but for the sake of the talk today, what I will say uh, for this last item is that these proofs have nothing to do with word combinatorics. Um, one of them specifically mentions surfaces and uh, Veach's paper talks about a thing that's associated to the surfaces without using the word surface in the paper, but certainly nothing to do with um, the sort of thing that we're, we're discussing here. Uh, so this is an example of why we can talk about subshifts. I'm just showing an example of encoding. Pretty much any dynamical system has the same, you can do this for many dynamical systems, but uh, here we're just showing how you can encode an interval exchange as a subshift. So a word, will appear in the language that you build from an interval exchange, if and only if you can find an orbit within your dynamical system that visits the appropriate initial intervals according to that word. That's what this is saying. So for example, um, one, uh, this point X begins in interval one, I map it then to interval four, it gets mapped back to one, it gets mapped then to three. So for example, that means that one, four, one, three is in the language, uh, if I follow a different point, for instance, y, I can also realize the word 3141. And you do this to capture all the words, and then that makes a language, and that language develops a subshift. shift 
as a subshift, and this is why I chose my numbers this way, um, a K plus one interval exchange typically has complexity exactly equal to Kn plus one. And there's, that particular fact has been known for a very long time, so I don't wanna make this slide look best, uh, misleading, but um, Ferenczi and Zamboni fully classified the properties that tell us whether or not a language or a subshift came in this manner from an interval exchange. And we'll mention this uh, result, or we'll mention this a little bit more later too. So that makes the, the timetable here make a little more sense. Uh, Bosher Nietzsche asked in his 84-85 paper, um, it, can this bound that we know for interval exchanges be shown using languages? So can we do this with subshifts? And I'll talk a little bit about the history of this in the paper where Bochenison asked this question. He showed that if I have a uniformly recurrent language, then based off of the limb inf of the linear growth rate and the limb sup, I can bound the number of ergodic measures. Um, now, there's an entire uh, kind of controversial history about the second point. Um, in his paper, he actually showed it for alpha less than three. Um, I think the first time I saw the theorem stated fully for any alpha, uh, he, he, the, the proof was clear, and he says at the end of the paper that he just didn't write the full proof down because it was too technical. Um, the first statement of this theorem was actually done, I think, in a, a lecture proceeding by Thierry Montiel, uh, Sebastian Ferenczi and Thierry Montiel. Um, and I'll mention a little more later about uh, other ways in which it's been really reproven, or, or not reproven, but proven. Just to keep score, this means that uh, Bosch needs to answer his question. If you accept that the second term is fully proven or accepted in his first paper, um, this has been this shows that the interval exchanges have the correct bound up to only four intervals. And so, a natural question might be: Well, was there a feature of this proof that uh, maybe could be improved upon? So, is it just that the proof maybe could have been made uh, stronger? The answer is no. Uh, in work by Van Seer and Brian Acraw in their GEMS paper from 2019, uh, they actually construct examples that exactly check all of the boxes. So they show that you get exactly the limb inf growth, limb soup growth you expect, and you get the number of ergodic measures that you expect. So there's nothing to be done with the statement of this theorem to improve it. So I think the next slide that I'm waiting on just is a sentence. So yeah, we need to restrict further. So as a first attempt on this, um, while actually Van Seer and Brennan Carl working on their paper that uh, appeared in 2019, we were working on one restriction playing into the complexity growth being much more restrictive. We called this eventually constant growth. Um, and we showed that if you at least restrict that far, um, then you get one improvement. So my, my running joke that you know got old before I told it first was that after 30 years, we improved the bound by one. And so just to keep track, this now works and tells us that we have the correct bound for interval exchanges up to six. And one question at this point that is still hasn't been directly answered is, is this bound sharp? So once we restrict ourselves to this exact complexity growth, uh, so to, to yeah, so my, my joke is a little bit facetious. Um, we were very excited about our improvement by one. I just wanna make that clear. Uh, so it's not clear this bound is sharp. I, I suspect it is, but um, we don't have examples. And so this is one moment where someone who likes to create things with languages, this would be a good moment to, to jump in. So despite not being clear on that, what we, we decided was our proof. We weren't sure if we could really improve our results using just what we had. So we dug deeper into this result by Frenzy and Zamboni about what makes an interval exchange uh, subshift. And it turns out that um, it's not all of the characterizing features, but this regular by special condition is a consequence. So interval exchange subshifts do satisfy this regular by special condition. And we use that property in our result to get to the bound that we were hoping for, which is k plus one over two. So are there any questions about this? Okay, so I'll, I'll spend a little time talking about 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, then there's also the discussion of generic measures. Um, this story for here uh, is a little bit uh, newer uh, than, than the story for ergodic measures. In 2015, John Chaika and Howard Mazur constructed a six interval exchange that had kind of what you expect in terms of generic measures, three, but they specifically constructed it with two ergodic measures, but one measure that was generic but not ergodic. And it turns out that the proofs that were used to show the bound for ergodic measures don't exactly work for generic measures because they don't have the same properties. So it was left as a question, is it true, for instance, that the number of generic measures have the same bound for minimal interval exchanges? And I, I like to point out here, unless, and I think this is the right room to contradict me on this if something is newer that I'm not aware of, um, it, has there been a proof of this? Because as far as I can tell, this is open. So um, meaning there's no proof. So if I would be really happy, for instance, if there was a proof of this that came first from word combinatorics. Uh, so th this is uh, why I want to re-mention. So the Vansier Brian Acraw paper I mentioned before didn't just produce an example. Um, uh, they proved Boschenitsyn's bounds, but they really also strengthened it in a lot of ways. So they proved the same numbers that Boschenitsyn proved for the limb imp and limb soup, but for generic measures instead of ergodic measures. So their proof is necessarily very different. And they also relax the conditions on uh, the language, um, which is the, one of the reasons why I'm not going to write this as a theorem, because then I'd be bound to make this precise. Uh, but most importantly, uniform recurrence is not required. So there's um, been... Sorry. Uh, sorry, John, for the yes. interruption. There's a question by Martin who uh, wonders about the one-half uh, quantity, and he has the following question. Say you take an invertible substitution. Uh, is it the one-half condition related? To the, uh, not, not say, sorry. It's, uh, he asked well, the fact that uh, interval exchanges are built from invertible substitutions, group automorphisms. So he asked whether it's the one half is related to this. Uh, that, is a, that is an excellent question. I really would not hazard to give an intelligent answer to that at the moment. Uh, no, that that's... Yeah, I, th I think that would be... Something I like to definitely talk about, but I'm, I'm I can't give a, a definitive one way or the other on that. Um, it, but it's a it's a it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. No. Thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, this is kind of the history portion, and then I just want to get to. Uh, I just want to get to a little bit about how we we perform, and, and kind of the frame of mind that we use when we're talking about these problems. Uh, so my first slide is meant to kind of cut from a lot of the words and also to kind of point out that I'm taking a, a direction away from, for instance, what I teach my calculus students about what is and is not proper work. The way that we do all of our things is we draw pictures and we color. Um, and my, my goal here is to explain in the next few slides briefly kind of how we go from the language to construct our pictures, talk about our colorings. Um, I'm going to try to keep it relatively high level. If there are questions, I do have some technical slides that give the details, um, and, and we can talk more about that as well. But most certainly, and my hope is that I at least give the idea of where the spirit of what we're doing is a little bit different than, than some other work. So in the first slide, I'm trying to demonstrate that we are, uh, we're building a graph, so we have to have something that we're drawing. What we do is we look at all of the Ruzi graphs, right? These are the graphs with the vertices of word sizes and edges given by by the, the words of the next size. Um, under even a eventually constant growth condition or even slightly more relaxed bounds, while the number of vertices, and the vertices are not showing up, um, at least for me, there are these arrows end at little dots. So you think of this particular Ruzi graph of having six words of length n1. There are, I think, 10 in total for length two and so on. So the idea is the graphs themselves are not going to be the same because the number of vertices necessarily are growing. However, if you restrict your attention to these special words or the branching points of the graph, you will find that there is going to be common structures by pigeonhole. There's only so many branching points you can have in these graphs if the growth rate is controlled. 
So we find a sequence of these that have the same picture if you just pretend that those edges become paths whenever you leave a branch point and you fix that as a base graph. And I should say multi-graph here because as you can see in this picture, for example, there are two edges directed that leave the left node going back to the right. So we, we kind of construct a, a picture based off of what we see infinitely often. And then we recreate a coloring rule and we use the ergodic measures to create the rule. Um, I should point out that this is definitely coming from Oceanitan's original paper in the way that we are constructing these colors. Uh, so what we do is we fix a particular vertex. You also can do this for edges, but it gets a little bit messier. You fix a vertex and that actually represents, for in this picture, this represents a right special word on your entire sequence of graphs. So you have W1, W prime, double prime, triple prime, and so on. And it kind of comes from an ergodic theory result, or it comes from just a measure theoretic kind of um, statement that you can construct a measure that you associate to this vertex. And you do that by ensuring that the frequencies of every word in your language are consistent with this measure. And you might have to pass to a subsequence to make this happen. But the idea is the densities of any word that you choose along these uh, base representatives of our vertex all have to converge to the measure. So we construct a measure. And then, as we mentioned before, if you're ergodic, you certainly have a generic point. And then you define a density function that counts how often these, built, these building words, WKs, uh, occur within this. And there's has to do with, a, it's not just that it occurs with a frequency, there's a there's kind of a linear um, dependence upon the size of the words. The key thing that makes the, the this is where ergodicity comes in. Um, if you have a positive density, then it follows that the ergodic measure that you started with uh, has a convex, uh, non-trivial way of writing it as a combination of the measure you associated to your vertex. And because you're extremal, that means that that vertex measure that you invented has to be the ergodic measure um, row in question. So there's no, so there's exactly, if it has one, it's exactly one. Uh, it cannot be two ergodic measures that are distinct. Um, you do a similar thing for the edges, but this is what we use as our coloring rule. Okay, so that dynamical portion uh, was there. But what's important for us then, our goal is to get to coloring. So the coloring itself has some rules. Uh, the first rule is that we're not missing anything. If we think of our coloring as having, um, uh, we're coloring with ergodic measures, we're not missing one. So all of them have to appear on this graph. The second rule I left vague on purpose, the edge and vertex colorings are consistent. What that means is if I color, um, if I color an edge, then the starting and ending vertices must also share that color. So the color of the edge has to match the color of the ending and starting vertices. And if I color a vertex, there must be at least one outgoing edge and one uh, edge that ends at that particular node that's sharing that color. So maybe there's other edges coming in and out, but at least one has to share the color. Um, a discovery that we kind of made between our first paper and, and our more recent result, uh, which is very nice, is that if an edge is colored, uh, then it belongs to a colored circuit. So um, that's a final property that we can think of. And I should note that this is a non-standard coloring for so many reasons, uh, one of which is that you can have that there are edges and vertices that are not colored. So. Um, if I was going to very much reduce down our first paper, this is essentially what we have is a lot of this is building up these colors. Um, and this is kind of our, where we are. So what we can do then is we can at least restrict ourselves to the correct, um, like maybe first Bosch needs in result. Um, in this picture, K is equal to four. That means that we expect to have at least, at most eight vertices in this graph. And I, we have demonstrated here a picture with four colors. Uh, and they follow all of the rules on the previous slide. So uh, there's a red loop. There's definitely an outcoming edge and incoming edge for each of these vertices. Same for yellow, same for green, same for 
cyan or, or blue. So the reason that we're writing this is that we need, the point of this is that we need to have more information than just drawing this one graph and this coloring rule to get the job done. Uh, so then uh, as, as kind of a classical understanding of languages, languages are defined by how their bispecial words evolve and how they extend. So we call these, uh, in our paper at least, bispecial moves. So returning to the picture that we brought up earlier in the talk, if you have a bispecial word, this is really where the branch points change their story from one step to the next. So this is a representative AA that's bispecial. These are all candidates for the next Ruzi graph. Notice the vertices that we're drawing in the picture are all the same. The middle one is regular by special, whereas the left one is not, and the right one is not. And a key thing to note here is that um, there's a locality that we're, we're losing something locally or gaining something locally if we're not regular by special. So what do I mean? In this top picture, uh, we have one left special word and one right special word. It just happens to be the same word. In the second picture that's regular by special, we still have one left special word and one right special word. And they have the same, uh, in this particular case, they even have the same valence or same degree. When we have other behaviors, we might lose left special words. So for example, in the leftmost graph, I have no left special word anymore. I've lost something. In the right picture, uh, we've added a lot more branch points. So the basic idea is that the language denotes how these things change, these graphs change, um, but they are controlled in the sense that you can define what can and cannot happen. So what we do uh, is we start with this, again, the blue represents the first building of our super uh, multigraph. And then you allow by special moves to dictate going to something interesting from each of the base graphs. So you go to some future n1 prime from n1, some future n2 prime from n2, and so on. You can pass through subsequence to then confirm you get one base picture, and then you create uh, a new kind of multigraph that's related to the previous one in a well-defined way. And you do it so that the coloring rules between the two are consistent um, up to your definition of consistent. So as a picture, what this means is that that contradictory, that contradictory issue, that thing where we had too many measures um, from our previous slide, um, because we assume that our languages are uniformly recurrent, one of the consequences is that you cannot have a loop continue forever. At some point, um, a, a loop continuing forever would represent in the subshift or in the language a periodic word. That cannot happen under minimality, so at some point the loop must unravel. And so in the picture here, it's, it's a little subtle, if, depending on your resolution, but notice that this edge changes. Now, instead of having a, a one going from one vertex and then one going back, they now both point in the same direction. By our coloring rules, that means that now our color must continue and spread throughout the graph. And so here's where our contradiction lands. For example, a red edge cannot end at a yellow node and a red edge uh, cannot begin at a blue node. We can't mix our colors. Um, and really, if we had that discovery from, yeah, so this is essentially getting us to our, our kind of our first result. We're, if we're a little more careful, you can not just discount that you have K measures, but you can also discount K minus one. And it has to do with if you, if you have too many colors in your picture, it controls the structure of the graph. But this is why we needed to improve something because once you don't have too many measures, you lose the explicit control we were looking for. Uh, so this slide is uh, saying that, so the regular by special condition used a couple of things. One of them I mentioned before, which is when we drew those evolutions of graphs, all of the changes can be kind of confined to local behaviors. So you, you um, so what do I mean by this? I mean that if you just had a constant growth rate, but you weren't regular by special, then maybe when you evolve one by special point, you grow or you give birth to a bunch of extra branch points, which has to be balanced somewhere else in your graph by the loss of branch points. And that's not something that uh, you can confine to one place. But um, because of this regular by special condition, 
what we do is recreate this auxiliary graph C. And this is the kind of the thing that took up a lot of our, our more recent paper is the discussion about why we can do this. But the idea is as follows. I, for each color in my graph, it's lambda, I fix one loop. I don't care if there are more, I just fix one for each. These loops do not have to only be length two. They could be length three or, or more. Um, there are evolutions that can happen across time for each of these loops. So what we do is we just draw around it. We pretend the rest of the graph does not exist. We let each of those loops evolve until their end. So maybe in this picture, for example, the red loop um, kicks off one vertex that loses its color, uh, but retains itself as a two loop then after that. And the two loop can't do anything in this picture on the bottom, it's somewhat boring, so we just keep it there. The key thing that we do then is we, we let each loop do its thing, we let each thing evolve, and then we remove those loops from the graph. We, and then, so we form, a, a, from a complement, a new graph, and we remove the direction, and we call that thing C. Um, the point is that, just like in that previous picture, once these loops have finished, there's going to be a, a time when those loops have to then unravel and spread their color. And so the, the idea is if we believe that this graph is related to any of the graphs we could build, the next lemma uh, gives us the main result is that once we've detached those graphs or detached those loops from the graph, the remainder has to be weakly connected because we have to be able to draw, once a loop spreads its color, we have to draw totally through a safe space, um, a circuit that has been created because the color spread. So the, the key pivotal statement in the, the, the paper is that if you satisfy the regular by special condition, you can prove then that this new graph we've invented or made up in the paper, it must be weakly connected. And then that reduces everything down to a very kind of almost, uh, it's like silly, you know, basic graph theory problem. That means that the the graph that we've invented must at least contain a tree. And then the algebra follows from here when you count what it means to remove the loops according to the definition. So this is this is the level of, of depth I wanted to give today about the, the proof for ergodic measures. And I want to then briefly describe um, how we translate our way of thinking into the generic measure world. So as stated, the ergodic measure uh, coloring rule won't really work well because it really needed the extremality of measures to work. Otherwise, we could potentially color things with more than one measure and other things break. So what do we do? We, um, we fix uh, any proportion that you care about. Just it, just it just needs to be much larger than the K, which is the growth rate that we assumed in our theorem. This is the thing, this is the, the limit reminding of P of N over N. And what we do is we can create walks on a, a fixed Ruzy graph. And the walk has a length that's equal to the proportion or of at least the proportion of D times uh, the length of the words. And you, you create one of these walks uh, for each row. Each row is a generic measure. And you would probably hope this is true if this is gonna make any sense for our proof, but the walks are vertex disjoint. So what you're doing is you're making long walks on a graph. That graph has a finite uh, number of vertices. It has something like Kn vert vertices. Um, and these walks are much, much, much longer. So you're gonna have things like loops. Uh, my slides here are a little bit out of order, so I'm gonna skip over two of these for a moment which of course means uh, a multiple of two clicks. So that means that um, instead of coloring these super graphs from our first construction, you just pick a Ruzy graph and then you color the vert vertices and edges by these walks. Uh, the, the, the takeaway though is you still get loops. So a lot of our machinery from our 2017 paper from the structures uh, still comes into play. But not all of the rules from the ergodic coloring will come and will work. For example, this picture that literally haunted my dreams uh, while we were working on our first paper can happen now. I have a, an edge that uh, is colored but does not belong to a circuit. So whenever a color spreads now, it's possible that it spreads and just empties out into a new uh, loop and never comes back. 
So this is the big kind of issue that um, that changes why we can't just use our, our k plus one over two proof. This is one of the reasons why this fails. And another issue, which is a little more technical, is that it's not quite as acceleration friendly. I can't go to really far off future times uh, with these colorings and expect to have a relationship anymore. So there's some parts that I can use, but they do break down. Let's see, I think with some of the people in the room, I will, um, so I'll briefly explain, I'll go back to the slides about how the coloring rule comes into play and why it's different, because it's defined using words. Um, and then I'll get to kind of a recap of kind of the open problems. So I, I wanna say that the way that we adapted this coloring rule, it came right out of the initial steps from Brian, uh, Van Seer and Brian Acraw's um, paper. They did something, they started the same way um, with, with small print. You fix two generic measures that are different. To be a different measure means that there has to be some way of distinguishing them. So you fix a cylinder that gives you the different measure for each uh, row and row prime. So there's a different value that you achieve here. Okay, well then, because you have these generic points, then you can fix a largeness of, of the prefix of this generic point x row, such that the density of w within that word is arbitrarily close to the measure assigned by row for that cylinder. And you do this so that it's way, way, way smaller than the difference between these two measures, or the difference between the measures assignment for the two cylinders, or the, for the cylinder. And so I point out that the smallness here depends on your, your preconceived choice of what D should be. If you do that, then what ends up happening is, and this is kind of the, the transition that I, I found to be very, very um, one of the things I found to be really awesome in their paper as well, is that once you fix the smallness, you then can control that for any word of length n along this generic point, any word of length n that goes out to at least that distance uh, d that the d times n, um, they all have a closeness to that, uh, the densities for all of those have the same closeness to the measure, or at least they have a closeness that is controlled. So you can do this, and now that means that I have a walk. Uh, a walk would just be the thing that you obtained really from the word of starting at length, uh, starting at n naught up to dn, and each window of length n along the way has the property that their densities fit this criteria. And the same is true for the words that you encounter for row prime. So if you just collect all of those words together, you collect your walk and you, you get something that belongs to the language. It's something of containing only length n words. Um, because of this condition, for instance, the stuff that I collect here for row and I collect for row prime have to necessarily be different. And that's, that's how the, the coloring is constructed. Okay, so I have a few questions, some of them I've, I've mentioned before, and the remainder, I um, I think the most of them have already been mentioned. I just want to recap um, since the, the talk is coming to an end. The first is, um, as I mentioned, our, our, the, is, the, is the bound from the 2017 paper that, we, that Michael Dameron and I wrote, is that sharp? So can we construct examples that achieve the number of ergodic measures that we are expecting um, while still maintaining that we're uniformly recurrent? And even if maybe this condition is too strong, maybe the relaxed condition that P of N over N goes to K would still be, would still be good. Uh, the next question, do there exist examples with, uh, th this is more of a general question. It's been asked to me in talks as well, and I don't have a, an answer because uh, it's not been uh, where I've been looking, but do there exist dynamical systems that do satisfy this growth condition when written as a subshift that are not uniquely ergodic um, and also didn't just come from interval exchanges? So that's a, that's a question. If anyone has examples of something that satisfies these conditions um, that didn't just strictly come from an interval exchange um, or their cousins' uh, linear involutions, uh, I'd, I'd be very happy to know of it. Uh, so yeah, a question, 
so, uh, so I, I'm sorry, I, I caught the question. So I, I want to classify, I'll take anything in terms of what it means to be not from an IET. Um, strictly, certainly if it's clear that it's not the natural coding, that would be nice. If you could demonstrate that it's not even, um, not even isomorphic in some way to an interval exchange, that would be even better. So uh, thank you. So thank you, uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, for this. Sorry, I'm playing with my camera. I can't. Sure, sure. <laughs> so did uh, I, um, so, so, so you were finished. Was it right? Uh, I, I can be uh, very much. I think I just wanted to highlight again that the the last question I have on my slides is not just a proof of something that's already been known. This would be a moment of proving something that's an open question. That's uh, maybe the only thing I would I'd say. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much, and let's uh, clap again. Um, so uh, there's a question asked by Martin, and the um, first question uh, he asks whether um, what happens if you take an acidic expansion and with invertible uh, morphisms? Uh, do you expect to have this uh, denominator two in the upper bound? And Fabien um, uh, answered that there are unimodular acidic shifts that do not fulfill this uh, inequality. So I don't know whether Fabien you you hear me, and I guess you were referring to the half, one half. So you might uh, want to say a few words on this. Yes, I can, I can answer. So maybe I, I, I write too fast, but what I had in mind is that there are some dimension groups, in fact, that can be realized uh, as a inverse limit of matrices, we have our matrices, that, uh, that could have more traces, that is, ergodic measures, than the, the bound that John gave. So there is an argument that, uh, that is missing, but I think that it should exist. I strongly believe it, it exists. And I can give you reference. So references are a paper of Riedel in uh, 81, another one of Andeman, Efros, and Chen in realization of uh, dimension groups by inverse limit of uh, new modular matrices. So yeah, I think it should exist. Uh, thank you. Could you, uh, could you post that information in the chat? Uh, yes, yes. For the papers? So Thank that you. means that you would have incidence matrices which were would, would would be invertible, but the substitution would not be invertible. Is it what you have in mind, Fabien? No, both. Oh. From your paper, if the okay. substitution are invertible, if the matrices are invertible, your the substitution are invertible. I mean, are recognizable. Or recognizable. Okay, but uh, Martin has in mind uh, invertibility, uh, not. Uh, free group automorphisms. I guess. Okay, so still with the questions of Martin, are there more generic? Uh, yeah, are there more yes, generic? Uh, so, than, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, yes. So I, I misplaced a thank you. Uh, I was thinking a chatting thing, but uh, yes. Uh, I, I agree with Martin. I think these are interesting questions, and I think that creating, so Martin's question on the chat is about creating things that have, like Chaika and Mazur's example, more generic non-ergodic um, dynamical systems. And so, yes, I think that is a, that is a better question. That was my, my uh, page of, I would say, more interesting examples as well. So, yes, uh, and as I, I think creating generic measures, that's harder um, in, in some sense. So, yes, I'd be very interested in that too. So Fabian is giving uh, uh, the context example by a reader. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Valerie. I'm, no, 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 please go ahead. Um, my, my attention abilities now are, I'm seeing words in any way. I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, so I'm sorry, I think I'm seeing Ronnie's question. Um, uh, 
so what I can say is I think that there you have more control. So Ronnie is asking about weakening minimality or uniform recurrence, uh, and I, I so I should maybe make clear that the paper, the Sear and Craw paper, they just assume they have a very relaxed condition, and so they just count they count non-atomic measures as part of their bound to, to kind of avoid this issue. I think that if you assume um, either version of transitivity, so if uh, so, a transitivity I'm assuming here means point transitive, or you define your language by one by infinite sequence. Uh, if you do that, I think that a lot of the, the things that we do work, um, and I do think it could be adapted fairly well to give a bound for that as well, also. Um, So can you give a reference for more generic but not ergodic measures on subshifts? Uh, in terms of examples, I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm not much further along than, um, than many members of the audience, I think. The, the situation is that generic measures, the first, the time that I've seen this example done has been specifically um, Howard Mazur and John, John Trika and Howard Mazur's paper. Um, and what they do is they, they build the kind of they use a, a way of constructing non non uniquely ergodic interval exchanges, and they are careful to adapt it to force one of the measures to be not ergodic but generic. Um, so I, I think I would look there first as a way of kind of adapting how to build something that you might otherwise build that's ergodic and force it to lose ergodicity but remain uh, generic. But that's really I think the one reference that I truly have at the moment because I would point out that. Um, in the Van Seer Brian Acraw paper, their results have to do with bounding generic measures, but the example that they create creates ergodic measures. And as far as I recall, I believe the way they create those ergodic measures, it very much is ergodic. It's not, I think, a simple ad adaptation, at least, to make those generic but not ergodic. Uh, I just uh, would like to make a comment concerning your question for the possibility of creating at least two, uh, two ergodic measures, which would not be uh, interval exchange. So with the Dendre City formalism, with uh, this vision as uh, aesthetic sequences, so you, you keep this nice, we know which substitution to, to use to keep this nice combinatorial property, and then we have more flexibility to create uh, examples. So if you realize something in terms of product of matrices for which you, you know that you would have space with your products of matrices to be non uniquely ergodic, then it's not that difficult to, to create uh, substitution examples, and I'm sure Julien uh, can do that uh, easily. <laughs> I, 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 yes, thank you. Yes, I'd definitely I'd be very interested in anything anything that could be produced here. I think this is the right room to ask these questions. So, uh... And then you have a question by Nishant. Uh, so I, I'll let you maybe read it. So uh, I don't know whether the room can see the question. So if there are multiple measures on minimal subshifts in the low complexity, is there a nice relationship between the measures that you see? Are they completely unrelated to each other? Or is there some symmetry? What about the interval exchange case for this question with a minimality assumption? So, uh, so maybe, maybe just I mean, as a as a kind of a classical comment, right? So, one thing that's very strange about minimal non uniquely ergodic systems is that they essentially have supports, if you use the right definition, that are disjoint, right? So, the entire you could write out a disjoint set, two disjoint sets. You can partition your space so that one ergodic measure, um, even though it's dense, and the other one is dense. Um, one ergodic measure gives full value to one of those sets and zero to the other and vice versa. So in some way they're very, on the very base level, there really is not a relationship between the two, except that they somehow cannot play nice with each other. Um, uh, if, I, if there's like a more specific way that you're asking about how to connect them, then, um, but, but in general, that's the idea. Is that in, in, for instance, the examples, um, at least from the paper that I wrote about these non-uniquely ergodic ones, they really assign a lot of uh, they assign a lot of measure to specific intervals and not others. So they don't assign zero, but they assign uh, much more to certain subintervals, and you can control how much they assign to one versus others. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility, and they are very somehow independent in some sense. Okay, thank you. And are there more questions uh, at CIRM? 
No, no, it's okay. Okay. So, well, I think it's a nice time to stop uh, here. So, we'll resume in 15 minutes. But before, let's thank uh, John again for this very, very nice uh, lecture. <laughs> thank you very much.